You're listening to Black Like Me with Dr. Alex G., a podcast that invites you to experience the world through the perspective of one black man, one conversation, one story, or even one rant at a time. Here's Dr. G. Hey, this is Alex G, and welcome to another segment of Black Like Me with Dr. Alex G. You know, the past few weeks have been um, a bit heavy for my community with racial tension and things going on in the community, and I just need to process it a little bit. That's one of the beauties. There are several, but one of the beauties of having um, your own show, being a podcast host, is that you can um, you can vent or commiserate with with folks who are part of, of your listening audience. All right, so an incident went down uh, in the last, past few weeks where a young African-American girl was harmed in the school. Something went down with spraying perfume. The teacher, as I understand it, has an allergy to perfumes. A behavioral specialist was called to help remove the young girl. Not all the girls who were involved, because I think it was two or three, but this one particular girl out of the classroom. And two, two colleagues of mine said they went to the school with the mom, saw the footage of this behavioral specialist um, pushing this young African-American girl, I think she's 11, into a locker and landing on her, falling on her. No charges are being pushed, are being, um, there are no charges by the DA. Um, the police department is not charging the individual. And as it stands right now, he cannot come back to that school. He is not fired from the district. That he still has a job in the district should he decide to work. He cannot go back to that particular school and work with children. But the way I'm understanding it now, he can work in some other school um, around someone else's children. And so a couple of things come up about it. Um, it's in the paper. You can Google it. We can put some links to some things. There are folks who've written open letters to the, to the uh, response. To the, well, we can post a link to the superintendent's open letter. There are responses to her open letter. We can all tag in this. But there's just a couple of things I just want to state. Um, my sister and mother were both social workers. Uh, my sister's doing social work type work, but and she's still active. But my mom is retired. Um, as a black parent, um, not that we all put our hands on our children, but we know this, that if we had put our hands on our child on school property, we would be in jail or our child would be in foster care. Um, and that typically means in, in Dane County in a white home um, where these people, where these folks are paid to take care of children. There are some good ones and there's some not so good ones. So one, let's just establish that. That if I had put gone to my daughter's high school and put my hands on her, pushed her into a locker, fell on top of her, she'd be in foster care. I'd be in jail. But when I talk to my black brothers and when I talk to the community, but particularly black brothers, and you're going to hear a segment of this in a few minutes. Black men are saying, if I as a black man were in this role and I put my hands on a white kid, a white girl who's 11 years old, they said, you know, there would be they would they would be investigating my family. They would ask you, did he touch you as you were falling? Did you feel accosted in any way? Um, his paper picture would have been blasted all over the paper. He would have been fired. This is what the black community is saying, that this that these are double standards. And so we've got to at least process these questions. We can't just say, no, no, no. You're following the rules. We're following the rules. I understand that you have to deescalate situations. But when I sat in a meeting with the superintendent and her support team, one of the folks in the support team sat and said, um, um, I'm going to talk like I'm him. I'm a vet. And he said, um, if I were in um, active duty and someone from the other side, a military national enemy shot one of my fellow servicemen uh, or service women, dropped his weapon, held his hands up in a surrender um, posture, he said, he said, I could not take him down. I could not shoot him because I could be court-martialed or thrown in jail because he's surrendering. I, I, I would have to restrain myself. And this is expected of 19 and 20 and 21-year-old individuals to go and do this. How do you get a grown man, a grown man, to, not, to, to, to be hired in this position, to have benefits and union support and not know how to de-escalate a situation. Why are you in this job if you can't handle an 11-year-old girl? Why could you not handle some other backup? How are we training men half his age to not shoot someone who just in front of his eyes shot or in front of anyone's eyes shot a, a, um, a fellow soldier? And you have to restrain yourself because they surrender. How could he not control himself in something that's certainly not as egregious or violent? 
as shooting a fellow service um, service person. So I'm just putting these questions uh, out here. I don't have anyone in the studio who's going to answer. I just need to need. To, I just need to vent. And let me ask this question: What happens? When you have this situation and your pastor is not the pastor of one of the most prominent and established and longest standing um, black churches in all of Dane County. What happens when your pastor is not Marcus Allen and he does he doesn't have the ability to tap he or she did not have the ability to tap into a congregation of folks with um, legal experiences, administrative experiences, educational system experiences. So not only did this happen to this young lady, it happened in a way where she had back up she has someone supporting her and still no one's in trouble for this not hot enough trouble this woman had this young girl had had hair pulled out i've seen the pictures of the bald spots i've interacted with um the mother the grandmother and the daughter when you get attacked like this you think about this stuff for a long time i'm a pastor i do family counseling people talk to me about fights they had 35 years ago and this girl's got to feel at at home what I need to really hear from um, from the, from MMSD, the Madison Metropolitan School District, the school board, is what is not what is to not be tolerated um, from from personnel. Now, this was overturned, but the girl was also told that she was suspended. Um, the response from the school district was, but we overturned it, but we overturned it. And those kinds of suspensions, as I understand them, and as I understood it in that meeting with the superintendent and her staff, was that that's reserved um, for incidents where the principal needs to collaborate with district personnel without any intervention from the district personnel, i.e. the superintendent's office, the principal sent a note to the parent saying that um, that the child was suspended. Again, it was overturned. But these are just things that are just making you just go, hmm, this is this is just wild. And so the community, the community is upset. A lot of us were silent. Um, because the family needed us to stand down and let their defense team and their representatives and their pastoral support run with it. So there are many of us who were in those early meetings who did not take to social media, who did not take to our own venues because we were asked to just let the process the way the family had planned it and the way their support had planned it. Um, uh, let that let that happen. And I totally um, re- I totally respect that because a part of being a strong leader that you got to follow leadership. But now that it's out, the video is out. The findings are such that um, no one's really paying for what's happened to this young girl. Um, she's she's going back into the same school and she's supposed to feel safe and protected. Um, and this is just burning me up. Um, I got a clip sitting in my in my studio interviewing two gentlemen, Anthony and Aaron, about an upcoming conference that they're that they're putting on. It's a reentry conference. But before we got into it, they just say, hey, I just got a vent. And so I just I just turned the microphone on so that I could just hear these are dads and just what they're thinking and what they're feeling. And um, man, I, these are large men. These are brothers. Their eyes got water. Their voices started quivering that they, they're asking the question, what's what will it take for our kids to feel protected and to feel safe in these scenarios? And then you get you know, you get people saying, you know, like a, like one of our school board candidates saying, you know, we just need structure. They just need a strong hand. They just need to for, you know, worry about um, 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 school. And we get that if the problem were only with children with behavioral problems. But there are all kinds of problems in our district. Um, my daughter being told she could not that she would not be admitted into Wisconsin. And she was just offered five years funding for a Ph.D. program from the same university she was told not to apply to. Now, only did she get a scholarship for undergrad for her undergraduate work. My wife and I owe zero dollars to the university for my daughter's four year education and her baccalaureate degree. She now gets admits she gets, she's admitted to two different programs at Madison, a master's program and a Ph.D. program. The Ph.D. program, I won't say to the department because she's until she decides, but they have offered her five years of funding for a master's and her Ph.D. And this is a daughter who I had to force to apply to Wisconsin because she doubted her intelligence because her guidance counselor told her she wouldn't get in. So 
folks who are just thinking kids just need to focus on education, shut your mouths. Because this is not just kids that are pushing behavioral specialists. These are kids who are in National Honor Society. They're in AP Spanish. They raise money. They travel the world. They volunteer in libraries. They give back to the communities. And they're told that they're not smart enough to go to a school that wants to pay for their education because they believe that they are one of the future professors in this country. Um, so I want you just to hear these brothers because I want folks to understand when we talk about the treatment of kids in our schools, we are not talking about the kids who the school district or who children of their own doings may be pegged as troublemakers or having some emotional challenges. We are up in arms because the children like my daughter and many other children of my colleagues whose children um, do not have those those behavioral issues or challenges are finding themselves blocked in our district as well. And I'm just saying, let's fix it. I'm not trying to get anybody fired. I'm just trying to get someone to matriculate. I'm trying to really fix this, but I'm tired of being told to wait. We're tired of being told to wait while these things continue to happen. So I want you to listen to what my brothers are just saying before we go into um, the interview we were scheduled to go into. But I just want you just to hear um, what fathers, who were also told are not involved in their children's lives and don't give a rip about what's going on, were also told that if these children had strong fathers, they wouldn't have these issues. These are men who have been involved in their children lives. I want you just to listen to them for a minute. I want to ahead. ask about the little, the little girl. And and I and I really just in my heart of hearts, I really think that not only does that affect the black girl, but I think it affects the black community. I think it's a direct disrespect in the sense of we can do whatever I, we want to do to y'all and, and y'all just got to deal yeah. with y'all not going to stick together nobody's going to come together it ain't if we want to stomp you kill you we didn't show we didn't sh- we shoot you on tv all the time it's justifiable we we're not going to get angry we're going to sit down we're going to have a few meetings we're going to intellectualize this is okay and why this happened at what point like do we change the norm like this is just i mean it i just don't i just don't it just ain't acceptable in no way shape or form well i guess i can say just a little something to that but i was kind of sharing with aaron before as far as you know one it's the generational thing that has to change because a lot of times um a lot of times that for i feel that for some white folks it's kind of like all right well you know this is this is the norm. We don't care. It, you know, it's not happening to us, and and they don't care about each other. They're savages in some way or, or form. Or I fear them, so I got to show them that I have more power than them. Um, and you, you, you know, because I think even I'm, especially when it comes to, I'm, 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 I'm just thinking if it was your boy, right? Your boy's coming to you, Lexi coming to you, looking you in your face, right? Like blood yeah. coming from her head. Mm-hmm. Somebody had to. I'm talking about Lexi really talking to you like, Daddy. This is what they did to right. me. Come on, man. You can't. Like, I feel like it becomes so general. That little girl, she is our kid, right? And so that's. I, I'm not saying nothing you said is wrong, but I just. I, I don't know. It just. It's more that needs to be done. It's, I, I, I mean, don't know. How, but but how it's, did, it's, it's, it's not. The, the problem is, I feel, the, the problem is, it's not just something that's going to be done just right now. It's something that has to be done and it has to not only be talked about, but have to show true action every freaking day. Every freaking day. Black History Month is it's not something just to be talked about in February. It's something to be talked about every freaking day because we've added more than just the, the 28 days. Everything else is shared. I'm not saying anything about any other cultures but until you start having those types of conversations every day and being real there's there's no way in hell that that this 300 pound man should have should have ever ever even came close to being uh, um to hurting this 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 little girl period who who de-escalates him because his job is to de-escalate little girls so who 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 de-escalates his big ass right Right. i I mean but and and that's that's what it is until again until we start we have to be able to it's not just it's not even just the system because even I, i feel culturally there's a system even within that you know that we don't necessarily always talk about let that man attack a young white girl some let him right. let him or let the right. roles be reversed. My black ass will be in jail. That's right, right. right. That, excuse me, but you, the, you know what I mean. But this is real. That's the frustration. Your ass is black. Historically, if you look over 
just little shows like Little House on the Prairie. Mm-hmm. and it, it, you, you see all of these shows, you never see. It was almost like the intent was to erase blacks from history. Thinking we started, we a lot of times we only think that we started from the civil rights perspective. We, we, that's why we have movies like Coming to America. They're they trying to g- give us back stuff that we didn't even know or they wasn't even telling us who we are. And, and 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 that has been stripped. But but but, but those I, but, are the things. Those are the things that I'm I'm just trying to convey because when you start to just if, if you just hear what I'm saying, no, I hear, from I hear from you. a very broad perspective, like the agenda was to erase anything about who we are, any accolades, anything that. But Aaron, I'm sorry to cut you off. Done. But Aaron, but I also feel that it's not. I, I think, yeah, I, I agree with you. But also, we have to also do our own research as well to find out who in the hell we are and be able to come to have have a, some type of concept. But because if we don't do it, we can't always depend on other people to do it for us either. Well, and I'm working with folks from, from campus like Dr. Christy Clark Pujara, who's who works with our U.S. Black History course for um, for non-black allies, but she has agreed to do things for just African Americans, so mm-hmm. we can ask questions and not feel like we have the awkwardness right. of white people weighing in and saying, "Well, that's not true, that's mm-hmm. propaganda." So I want to work on doing that because we do need we do need to learn. But I also think something we've got to do is understand. You know, we all work together at Nehemiah. Right. Part of what we have stated is that to bring about sustained change has got to happen at least on a policy level, mm-hmm. a practice level, and then personal interaction, right. those three Ps. Um, within our own leadership, we have to understand that we need we need mobilization for um, rallies, education, mm-hmm. protests, but we got to be in the in the capital changing right. policy. Exactly. And then we got to be That's where, in exactly. board meetings. Yeah. I think we have to understand all right, we're going to be here in the community. We're going to be doing whatever it is we're doing, educating, empowering, mobilizing folks, having rallies. But somebody's got to be saying, all right, we're going to either audit what you all are doing or we're going to look at how you make in policy mm-hmm. we're gonna, or how you how you make in your hires. We're going to look at that. But then policy, we got to talk to DPI. We need a higher rule about what this is like. Like who set the rule right. that a behavioral specialist um, has the training and the wherewithal to be able to put their hands on a kid, we got hit it at all three levels. Mm-hmm. What's got to happen is our white counterparts and in other communities, they'll hit it on all three. Mm-hmm. We think that it's only at, it's only at the Capitol, it's only taken into the streets, exactly. or it's only in the boardrooms inside organizations. And it's exactly. all the above. Right. We got to do eat all the above yeah. and hit that, and we got to mm-hmm. be able to celebrate that and, and trust that. So part of, you know, part of our work is, is understanding that if we don't do a better job, of respecting each person's lane and affirming them in that lane, mm-hmm. then we're going to miss opportunities. Like I was in an initial meeting with the superintendent and the representatives of the family, mm-hmm. and we were asked to not take to social media and talk about what we knew. Mm-hmm. But then when you do that, you have your own folks saying, well, where are the leaders are not saying anything. Right, right. We were very careful to not tip the hands of the legal case mm-hmm. by just putting too much information out because we don't want folks to say, Oh, that's their strategy. Let's refute this. Let's right. go get a record. You know, we found out in the press conference yesterday, the DA's office was asking the mother to be well. Well, yeah. have you right, to be investigated? Yeah. Well, let's ask this guy if he's ever beat his children. Right. Exactly. So, yeah. so why are you asking the mom? And if you were concerned about her, one, she wouldn't be a substitute teacher in your system. Two, why do you only bring it up when she's got a case that's coming mm-hmm. up? Uh, but to me, that part is absurd, and that's a piece of what the community's got to be. It's got to be called upon, mm-hmm. but to not tip her case, we all button our lips at the request of the, the family's family. team. Right. But we have to trust mm-hmm. that folks are talking and folks are are moving together on this. But even I think you hit it on the head. One, it stems the trust because there because a lot of times there's so much um, separatism. I guess yeah, sure. uh, between. The people that who are going to the capital, the people that who are in in, in the in the community, and the people that who are in, in the middle in, in the middle sure. ground, and there's not enough conversations to say, hey, look, but this is the way how, because of, and because I, I think it's it's two things. I think you you kind of mentioned it as far as it's one thing of, of some people feeling like, hey, you need to stay in your lane, right? You know what I mean? Right. But then also, I think what helps people be able to stay in their lane when there's communication that to other people to say, hey, look, but this is what we're doing. We need to be able to keep this on the rest because of this, that, and the other. And not to say that everyone is going to fo- 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 follow that that rule, right? But I think when you when you have 
we have some type of trust to our community advocates, to, to, to our people who stand in the middle ground. And also, as again, when you're talking to the people that um, downtown, to be able to say, look, these are the issues. What are you going to do about it? We need you to start acting fast. or Because if you don't, X, Y, Z, this is what's going sure. to happen. This is the ripple effect of this situation. Now, you know, there's going to be, like like you had mentioned, there's a ripple effect with this with this little girl. Mm. Just in her life, the fact that she's been, uh, she was assaulted by a grown man and a teacher. Someone that who you're supposed to believe in. Someone who's supposed to believe in you. How do you go and, back to that yeah, school? Yeah, how do you go back? No, freak that. How do you go back to any school? Right. She's permanently damaged from that. I'm just thinking if I was attacked, uh, attacked by some grown man as a kid, at some point, my thing is, you you know what? You're traumatized. I, yeah, I'm traumatized for the rest of my life. Definitely. Unless and, someone is working with this child on a regular basis, or what the hell is going on? And, they, well, and, and they're working on it. But, how but how do you put but it how in do, a black space? But how does that, but you know, how does that, who monitors that and how right. that happens? And I want to say to you, Coop, I have sat in those multi-generational mm-hmm. meetings and they don't always go well. Right, but, yeah. Because, so I want to, so I want to make sure people are understanding that the relationship building has got to take place outside those meetings, and we can't just congregate when um, when there's an, when there's an issue. But I've right, been in right. meetings where we try to have these discuss. I've been in meetings yeah. and privy to meetings where we said, "Okay, this is the plan. Don't mm-hmm. say anything," and something was said. Yeah, no, very true. So part. Of, so I want to let people know there are black folks who are talking. Mm-hmm. We're trying to give advice to each other. We just have to keep at it. We just have to keep Absolutely. doing yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I don't. Yeah. I don't a, a and then I got to switch to the other the other thing that we're really in oh, here okay. for. Okay. No, no, no. But <laughs> when I'm in a studio, I love to keep the microphone going because you because some of the so anyway, Aaron, say what you're saying because you just never know when. No, no, no. Let's, let's brilliance. move on. Let's no, move on. say what you want to say. I, 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 I just I'm is, in agreement with you this, all. This saying. is yeah. my thought, and I don't know if this. So this might have to be edited, but I'm just being honest with you. If I come into your office and something happened to Lexi, I'm not there. I ain't arrived. So I find out who did it. They gotta they gotta suffer the same way she did. Sure. We're Period. definitely we're something definitely happened to right, his right, boys. Right, right, right. Something happened to his boys, no, I promise you. All that all that all this five P's, three P I don't care about none of that. There's no way in God's green earth somebody should be jumping on any one of your kids. I know you. That that affects me just like and, and and I know you got to keep your composure. Don't even lean on. It. I didn't been there before, so I understand it. I'm not with. I'm not gonna let that happen. Man. I just can't, and that's why I try to stay far away from that because I know me. I'm, I'm listening to all the education mm-hmm. behind all of this. Come on, man, that's wrong. Everything right. about. And, and we're agreeing. Just, I'm, I'm yeah. not. I'm not saying you're not agreeing. Okay. I'm not saying there's. I'm saying there's a right way. All of these things is, is very right. Everything y'all saying is on point. But at some point, that's wrong, man. Yeah. You cannot jump on an 11 year old girl and you 50 some years old and justify that you need your ass. And, and, yeah. and, yeah. and, yeah, no, and you keep your job. Yeah. And you keep your and job. Yeah, he's using. Yeah, he's using. Yeah, he's, he's, yeah, he's like, I asked about this specifically. <laughs> he's using vacation. He's accrued. Uh huh. But he's he can't come back to that school. But he can go anywhere else. You're right, and that part was clear. Yeah, and that's crazy. No, because if crazy. I jump on somebody, not even I, in the school, you jump on me. You going to jail, yeah. right? I'm going yep. to jail, <laughs> right? Right. And there ain't gonna be no intellectualizing, justifying, mm-hmm. trying mm-hmm. to sit down and have research, and all. it ain't finna do none of that. You going straight to jail, and, and then we're gonna, gonna figure it. We're gonna we'll figure, figure it out, out from there. Why you locked up? Ooh, well, hundred thousand dollar bond. That's right. <laughs> you know. So. so this system. Let me let me switch this. Anyway, I appreciate you all saying that. Yeah. That's why, brothers, we you got to come into the studio more more often. You know, I don't know if I got to pay y'all to come or give you food or something. But <laughs> Aaron, day, Aaron bro. said was going you know going to come more regularly. We ain't seen you. But no, but no, but these, but these real conversations, you all. I mean, what I love about this is we're three fathers that are talking about had this right. been our son yeah. or our daughters, yeah. and that we feel very. Um, we feel some kind of way about this right. because this is setting a pattern and it's following a pattern and it's being okay. Like, so anyway, I get you. So this, the whole system is really jacked up. So it turns me just a bit to just to ask you all, take a deep breath. I, I feel the tension in the room. There's some, <laughs> there's some black testosterone up in this room. Aaron is talking about he going back to jail. Aaron, look, you know you, listen, Aaron, you know they know where you are. So don't be. We might have to edit this part out. Um, uh, <laughs> So Eli, don't edit out that comment because it was important. Just make it sound like Coop's voice, because <laughs> Coop ain't on the bracelet. They know where Aaron's at, and so in fact, in fact, hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, who is that? Um, security, <laughs> podcast security. So we got to keep you out out of jail, Aaron. 
but but no, I appreciate I appreciate your um I appreciate just the the, the candor and listen. Mm-hmm. Even if we don't find a way to bring all the groups together, let's make sure we bring the people together who want to be together because we cannot let up mm-hmm. on this. Oof. All right, man. While I'm on a roll, let me just keep uh, keep venting. But you know what? Talking about this stuff makes me need a makes me need a drink. I think I'm gonna start doing a segment on Black Like Me that's called "Where's My Whiskey," and just kind of loosen myself up to talk some more about this stuff. All right, let me move on to another situation. In our community, we're working to build racial harmony. And so my organization, Nehemiah, has an initiative that's called Justified Anger. We put a link on this podcast so that you can read it. And if you like the work, you can even support what we're doing. Um, we'd appreciate that. But um, we're we're working to bring mainly white would-be allies, but non-black allies, into the knowledge of how we've gotten to where we are in terms of the position of black people in America and racial divisiveness, et cetera. So we are in our fourth fourth cohort of our annual nine week U.S. black history course, U.S. black history. We bring professors from the University of Wisconsin, a team of four profs, and we t- they teach over nine weeks. And it's phenomenal. Um, for the last three years, we have capped the class at 250 people, 250 paid people, because after the one hour lecture, they break up into 25 groups of 10. You keep the same group for the whole nine weeks. And you process what was just lectured on because the the thought is white folks have got to talk to white folks about race. Um, They can't just come to an issue and just a situation and say, hey, Alex, tutor us, mentor us, um, show us the way. And so it's really meant for folks. um, 95 percent of the participants are white. The others are non-black, but from different ethnic backgrounds. And so this year we have just registered a 900th participant. First group was 150. Then the last three groups were 250 each. Um, but we had a 100 person, we had 100 people on the waiting list. These are 100 people who could not get in, who are willing to pay, could make the time in their schedule. The class would have had 250 people. Listen, this thing is so large. It takes 40 volunteers to facilitate it. Um, I, I'm going to, um, I'm asking Eli, my, um, my engineer, let's put up a photo or two, a link so people can see what the class looks like, maybe a slide or something. So we decided to do something with those who could not get into the class, the wait list, the wait list. So we called it, you know, the U.S. Black History Cliff Notes with Dr. Alex G. And even though I'm not one of the profs of the process, I do an opening sort of a monologue each of the nine weeks to thank the individuals for participating, to encourage them to lean in through the awkwardness of new history that they and it's not weird, wild history. It's just stuff that wasn't in their white textbooks. And we asked them to do something with the knowledge. And so um So I decided let's connect with the folks who couldn't get in because we don't want them to just wait another nine months before they can do this. So we had a great event last night. About 60 people showed up um, and I just talked about my history and my genealogical journey and what I wish I had been taught as a young black person. I talked about how in Chicago I was in an all black kindergarten with one white kid, an all white, I'm sorry, an all black first grade where the teacher was black and and supported me when as a six year old in second grade, a six year old in first grade, I stated I wanted to be the president of the United States. And she writes it on the chalkboard um, to confirm that this is my dream. No one laughed. No one snickered or thought that it was unbelievable. I moved to Madison for second grade and I come home and ask my mom, were we really slaves? So I went from an environment where the teachers looked like me, the students looked like me, the culture looked like me to being in Madison where I'm one of two black students in a class and the whole class is taught that the people who look like me and Reggie were slaves. Sparks all kinds of conversations on a park, on a playground about you are slaves, people laughing, we set you free, you ought to thank us. So we just explained how blacks and whites begin learning um, historical um, images of inferiority and superiority as early as second grade, at least in Madison, Wisconsin. This was my experience. So I was just doing this this one hour lecture. Now, on the same night, men who have been incarcerated um, participate in a program that's called Man Up. And just for you know, it's just it's a support group by black men who have been um, for black men who have been incarcerated. Anyone, but mainly black men who have been incarcerated and it's led by black men who have been incarcerated. It's phenomenal. It's not a social worker. It's not a parole agent. It's someone who's looked like them, been through the issues, working through the issues. Um, and and have overcome. It's a powerful, powerful thing. I started it um, years ago, but I handed it off to 
two participants in my group, in my man up group to run it because I realized although I was a black man with a doctorate, I was not an expert in things related to reentry. We needed folks to um, be able to to lead this who had the lived experience. I love it. I love it. We, we call this practice based evidence. So after they finished their man up group, they came upstairs to be in the lecture. The coordinator, Aaron, wanted them to be in the lecture, so he brought them upstairs. And, you know, I'm a public speaker, so I can tell when people are listening to what I'm saying. They were in tune. They were engaged. I could read their body language. They connected with me. Uh, I could feel their eyes connected with me. They were appreciating the fact that I was talking about the strength of the black community and a part of our history, the good part that's never told, uh, the strength of Reconstruction, 16 black men being elected to Congress, 40 black people being elected to state positions in Mississippi before 1900. At one time, they just all stood up and walked out. Now, the audience is predominantly white. I don't want to make it look like they got mad about something or they were, you know, so I just said, oh, you know, right over. I interrupted my speech and just said, hey, thank you, gentlemen, for coming. The organizer said, we'll be back. So I'm thinking, why'd they go downstairs? You know, you know, where they, what happened? So then after we finished, my colleague Harry was doing a wrap up. Aaron came, to, he came over behind me. He said, hey, Pastor Jack, I tell you what happened. A sheriff deputy came by the building, saw or knew that these men were here. And these men, many of these men, um, if not all, are currently in a work release program, which means that they are still in custody, still in jail. We are able to pick them up from jail, bring them to this male support group and then drive them back to jail. So this is an this is an evening for empowerment. He said a deputy came by and she wanted to perform breathalyzer exams on each of the participants in the program. It's about Nine black men, one white man, one or maybe two white men. Aaron said, no, we're not going to do this upstairs in the foyer. We're going to go downstairs. Let's let's maintain as much dignity as we can. So then I noticed that the men came back up and got in their seats and continued listening. So what happened is that instead of just waiting 25 more minutes until my lecture was finished, the experience was interrupted for these black men. They were embarrassed. They had to stand up from their lecture, step across people, go out, be herded and go downstairs, each given a breathalyzer exam. They weren't driving. We picked them up. We're taking them back. Um, if they were drinking alcohol, wouldn't the evidence of it be even stronger in their bodies? Um, do they think that we don't run secure enough programs that we would let men come and just open up a fifth and start drinking a, or drinking a pint of, um, of, of Boone's Farm right inside of our church? Do they not think that... We care about the dignity of our individuals or the sanctity of our programs. What necessitated a breathalyzer exam for these men who are sitting in a U.S. black history course? What precipitated that? So I'm still pissed. I'm still livid because if I did something wrong, if I were caught drunk driving, it would be blasted. There are black people in the news right now this weekend, Matt. It would be blasted. So when these things happen, these egregious things happen, I think it's only fair to blast what's happening inside law enforcement. And the, ir the irony of this is that part of my lecture was the history of law enforcement and black folks, the history of over-policing black folks, putting them back in place, bringing them back to their plantations, bringing them back to their owners, whether it's present or past. And so we're trying to build these relationships. I am currently in a dialogue with the chief of police, um, um, Chief Koval, because each year my organization um, works with West High School and the police department to put on a kids versus cops basketball tournament. The proceeds uh, from from the ticket sales help black kids to go on school tours on their spring break. They go to historically black colleges and universities. They go to major universities. This will be our fifth competition. The police department have lost all four competitions. But we come together to build this rapport. When you just walk in, and this was not the police department, this was the sheriff's department. When you walk in and randomly offer um, breathalyzer exams. Now, keep in mind, Man Up started in 2009. So we've been running this group for 10 years. My director of reentry, sir, he's my, my vice president, the director of reentry services and strategic partnerships wrote me last night and said, this has never happened in the history of Man Up. Let me find out what's going on. So I don't know what precipitated it. People can holler at me. They can tweet at me. They can talk to me. Uh, but this is my podcast. I'm going to tell you what I saw. I saw every last one of these men being walked out of this situation by the director of our, the assistant director of our programs, of our reentry programs. They, they disappeared for, I don't know, 10 minutes or so, came back. They missed some vital information. 
And I brought the, the assistant director, Aaron, up to the stage and say, tell these folks what just happened, because you can lecture about disparities and the history of it. But it's one thing to put it into context. And what I want people to understand is to just merely say these men, these men need to obey the law. Listen, I'm not refuting what they went to jail for. They went to jail, but they're in a work release program, which means that they've done their time or they've shown um, some penance for, uh, for what they've for what they've done, some sorrow. Their, their hearts are contrite. They've demonstrated some contrition, but they're in a place of empowerment. You know, um, a couple of years ago, um, Aaron, who now runs and facilitates that group, was told he couldn't come because we were empowering him. And I was asked, who am I to make him think that he's a leader? And so I just want people to know this is real. I've got better things to do just to get on a microphone and pretend there is so much reality out here that I want to use my time talking about it and the solutions. Part of the solution is we've got to air our dirty laundry and say this happens. This happens, you know, and it happens in your community too. ask somebody, get to know someone who's formerly incarcerated. Ask them. I had a white gentleman in the group last night who's telling me the things that's happening to him. So it's a broken system. But when stuff is broken, it's extra broke for black people and poor people and people of color. And so folks who listen to our podcast, I don't want you just to have your ears tickled at what we're doing. I don't want you just to become more in tune. I need you to do something with this. I need you to feel it. Go to my Facebook page. Um, take a look at the photo. Look in the men's eyes. Um, the picture, the group pictures, after they left out, came back, regained their composure, listened to the rest of the um, lecture, and stood around afterwards and thanked me for the material that I was teaching. Um, things that they were learning. One gentleman said, hey, Reverend G, can you help me come to church on Sundays? He said, because I'm told because I don't have a drug or alcohol problem, I can't come to your church. I've had other men who tried to come because church is not just about proselytizing folks. You've got to understand this about the black church. It is community and you don't have to pay to be a part of it. And so when you come out of jail and your family is in Kentucky and all you know are the people who got you in trouble, you need to be in this case with men. You need to be around men on a weekly basis who are with their kids and with their spouse and they got jobs and they got responsibilities and they're shoveling the snow in front of the door and they're handing out bulletins and they're volunteering to serve the children and they're driving the vans to take people home who don't have rides. This is free community. And it's that lack of community that makes Madison inhabitable for so many people. So I just listen. I just need you to understand this. And if you're not in the Madison area, connect with some groups that's doing reentry work, particularly if they're dealing with people of color. Um, part of my job is to shed a light on this, because if I don't, when I offer solutions, people don't understand it. So our solutions are not just getting men better rides from 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 jail to our programs, but it's discussions with um, um, the county supervisor, the, the board of supervisors, the 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 um, the sheriff. Deputy sheriffs, it's got to go higher than just the agent and the man or the woman that's trying to get programs and program services. What's wrong in this system that stuff like this happens and it goes unchecked? This is not unchecked. Check the records. You will find that someone came and did a breathalyzer test. So so if you don't believe me or believe the men, call somebody, ask, because I'm sure you cannot administer that test and not document something. So it's on the record for people to check out. Check it out. And maybe you can get an answer faster than I can. But um, listen, you all, if we're going to move this needle of racial harmony ahead, let's get our hand. Let's get our heads out of the sand and other places. Let's understand that this stuff shit happens. And unless we acknowledge that, we can't begin to put our heads together to begin to do something that's that's different. So let me tell you something that I'm proud about. One of the people who sat in um, my lecture he actually went through the history class two or three years ago. Um, um, his name is Don. He's, you know, he's becoming a good friend of our staff and our team. He's helping us on so many levels. But but, you know, he posted the picture and, and talked about his feelings. Another person said, um, and I don't even know if this person was there, but they saw Don's post. This other person posted the sheriff's contact information and said, maybe we should start contacting the sheriff. My one of my vice presidents, Dr. Karen Reese, said, you know what? White allies, you know, hey, we need to do something. And so I'm here on the microphone because I don't have to call the sheriff. I don't have to write the sheriff. That's the job of white allies. That's the job of white allies. You ask the question. Don't accuse anybody of anything. Just call and say, I'd like more information on an incident that happened at Fountain of Life Church, 633 West Badger Road 
on March 7th. Was that was on March 7th, a Thursday night? Um, Dr. G said that an incident took place. Can we just ask what precipitated the need for breathalyzer tests on pedestrians or men who are um, I guess they didn't walk there. Um, a breathalyzer test on men who were transported to our program. Um, I, I've just never heard of such. I always thought the breathalyzer tests were connected with swerving or or, you know, white politicians. I thought that it was just used in special, you know, <laughs> special situations. But but obviously, if you're sitting in a seat um, in a community event and you're learning about history, you might be sitting there sipping out of a brown paper bag or your flask. And so the sheriff department need to make sure you aren't coming back drunk. They knew the men were coming back and they're going back to jail. So what you going to do to them? Give them a ticket? You're going to tell them to touch their nose, walk a straight line, come to the altar, and repent of their sins? What? I'm just, oh, I need to get off this microphone. But listen, y'all, listen, do something. Listen, tell people about this podcast. You know folks who want to know more about what's going on. Listen, maybe I thought a year and a half ago as these ideas of creating black like me started and began percolating maybe a year, year and a half ago, I thought this might be entertaining or insightful. We're trying to create a movement in action. So please let folks know what's going on. People need resources to understand what's happening under their noses in their own communities. Because I believe that when people become convinced that this happens, they act. Let me tell you something. I'm not responding because I'm black. I'm responding because I'm human because I'm a taxpayer and this infuriates me. I did not believe that this happened until men in my man up group who I knew, respected and loved started telling me about the injustices they endure every day of their lives. These men had sat and were honest about what they did and how they got to jail. They did not sit and lie and say, man, I was just, you know, I was just, um, you know, I was set up. These men talked about their case their cases. I did deal drugs. I did do this to women. These things did happen. But when I came out, this is what I said. This is what my this is what my lawyer told me. This is what the DA said. This is what my agent said. This is what Department of Corrections put on my ankle for the rest of my life. Um, and as I began to hear their stories and get to know these people, I, be, I became embarrassed because I ignored their humanity and I belittled their dignity. But because I've gotten to know these men, so I want you to know um, I care about injustice. And so if it's white men and white women, it's not fair and it's not right either. But in a state that incarcerates so many black men on a per capita basis for so many for such a large rate of recidivism, the rate at which people return back to jail for such horrid, horrific statistics about a pipeline from schools to prisons or according to Judge Everett Mitchell from social services to jail and to prison. These incidents cannot go unheeded. They cannot go hidden. They've got to be brought to the light because these 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 occurrences exacerbate the microaggressions that makes life in places like Madison stressful, which leads to the social determinants of health. And these are the kinds of things that make black people more sick. The studies are out there. The science is out there. Part of our work is to capture this data, but we know that stress exacerbates illness. And we know that racial isolation, racial tension, racial profiling raises the stress of black people and the women and, and their family members who are around them and care for them, their children, their loved ones, their significant others, they share in this microaggression. And so when this level of injustice happens and is not explained fully and everyone's left, you know, the, the white folks in the crowd, many of them were infuriated. You know what the black men did? They shrugged their shoulders and they said, you know, what? this is life. This is not life. This will not be life. And as long as I got breath and a pulpit and a staff and a microphone and a studio and a brain and a soul, I'm going to fight to make to fight to make sure that this is not life. This is not the life I want for my friend, this is not friends this is not the life I want for people in this community. And if this is the life, then you need to be prepared, local communities, for how these men and women who are returning back to prison and wake up people. The bulk of people in prisons are coming home. Prisons are not filled with lifers. The bulk of people in Wisconsin prisons are coming home and how they come home. Will, ha will be a large determining factor of how they live at home. So educate yourselves. Go to Nehemiah.org. 
um, N-E-H-E-M-I-A-H. There's a link right on our page. Sign up to get our newsletters. Find out what's going on. We've got a reentry conference that's coming up um, on the 28th and 29th. Let me let me check. Let me check my day. So on Thursday and Friday, the 28th and 29th of March at Fountain of Life Church, we're going to put a link on that in the podcast. Come and hear your hear these stories for yourselves. Don't believe me. Um, Former Secretary of Corrections Ed Wall is going to be one of the speakers and reentry professionals and social workers and and teachers and, and, and affected loved ones are going to be there. You want to do something. You want to do something. Find the link to the conference. Repost it, circulate it to your friends. It's reasonable. You can afford to go. Come if you're near. What's if you're listen? Even if you're as far away as the Twin Cities in Chicago, come. Um, hey, catch a plane here and come. We've got good food, good custard, good fried curds. Um, come to Madison, but let's not sit back in our own private little worlds, pretending like this stuff is not going on. But if you come to the conference, you will find out what we're doing to address it. I do not hire people who merely piss and moan. That's that's the line my track coach used to say, John Gartland. He, you know, I was a quarter miler, so they used to work like crazy. Hey, quit your pissing and moaning and get back out in that track. Um, we're not just complaining about what's happening. We are building solutions. Our motto, our tagline for Nehemiah is we want a stronger Madison for all. You know what else? We want a stronger Dane County for all. You know what else? We want a stronger Wisconsin for all. You know what else? We want a stronger United States of America for us all. Because it's only when it's good for everybody that it's truly good. So, hey, whew, I'm up out of here. Had to get that off my chest. I came into the podcast studios on my own off day because I had to I had to talk about this so make a difference don't just listen subscribe 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 don't just listen come on don't just don't don't just subscribe then get your friends to subscribe and then tweet about it and tell people what you're listening to because you know folks who don't podcast and they would if you told them you found a good podcast people are joining the black like me family because they're, they've heard that someone else has said it. Don't let tell your friends. Don't let the name black like me scare you off. We're not going to hurt anybody here. We're going to wake you up. We're going to set you free with truth. But do something now. Don't just listen to this podcast and then go back to eating that ham sandwich at your desk um, or driving or jogging. Think of three to five people right now who need to hear this rant. Forward it to them and then tweet out at me. Write me on Facebook and let me know you did it. Thank you, um, America, for your listening and downloading. Um, and, and you've got us near 30,000 downloads. Um, thank you for Canada, Central America. We appreciate you. The growing numbers in South America, Ecuador. I've got some friends in Ecuador, and I think this might be you all. But thank you. Keep telling your, 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 you know, your friends in Argentina. Um, the audience is growing in Asia as well. Australia, the UK, we appreciate you. Um, um, Ireland and, 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 and London and Ireland and England, we appreciate you. And the folks in South Africa, I know those friends as well. And Namibia, thank you, thank you, thank you for your listening. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. You can find out more about Dr. Alex G's amazing work at www.alexg.com. Black Like Me is sponsored by the generosity of the Human Family Unity Foundation.